Right, so uh, I'm going to talk about the liar paradox, which is the paradox which was invented by Eubulides in the 4th century BC about the proposition, I'm lying. Uh, or put another way, what I'm saying is false, or the sentence I'm uttering is false. And now if we think about that sentence, uh, we say, well, suppose it's true. Then if it's true, things must be as it says they are, and it says it's false. So if it's true, it's false. But that's, if it's false, it's not true. So if it's true, it's false, and so not true. But that's a contradiction. If it's true, it's not true. So it can't be true. But if, it's, if it can't be true, surely it's false. And then if it's false, things are as it says they are. And that means it's true. So it looks as if it's both true and false. But notice that in assuming that, we assume that if it's not true, it's false. That is, either it's true or it's false. And that's a famous principle in philosophy, or in the theory of truth, the principle of bivalence, that uh, sentences, propositions, only have two values. There's truth and falsehood, and every sentence has to have one or the other. Now, one solution that people have thought about for the liar paradox is to say, well, perhaps the liar paradox is neither true nor false. Uh, the principle of bivalence you know, maybe applies to most sentences, but perhaps we can find some reason why we want to deny bivalence of the liar paradox. Well, one way, reason for thinking that that's maybe not going to prove an adequate solution is to look at the strengthened liar paradox. So instead of looking at the sentence, this sentence is false, we just look at the sentence, this sentence is not true. So we cut out that move between connect, bivalence connecting truth and falsehood, we just look at this sentence is not true. Now again, suppose it's true, then what it says is the case, so it's not true. So if it's true, it's not true, but that's a contradiction, so it can't be true, it's not true. But that's what it says. It says it's not true, so we've proved that things are as it says they are, so surely it's true. So we now have the contradiction that it's both true and not true, always assuming that it's either true or not true. But that's another famous principle in philosophy, the principle of excluded middle, that there's no third way. So an example, take the wall behind you. The wall behind you is either white or not white. There's no third possibility. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's white. Right? But if it, if it was another colour, it wouldn't be white. But there's no way it can be neither white nor not white. Well, similarly about the strength and liar. There's no third way it could be either, neither true nor not true. It's got to be either true or not true. But we've shown that if it is either true or not true, it's both true and not true. But we don't want to admit that anything is both true and not true. That's uh, another contradiction. Uh, and there's another principle, there are a lot of principles around in this, in, in this area, the principle of non-contradiction, that uh, nothing can be both one character and another character. Uh, the, wall, the wall, again, the wall can't be both white and not white, um, even if you have jokes about, you know, sometimes it's raining and not raining, if it's drizzling slightly in between. Uh, but usually we exclude that possibility, the law of excluded middle. So it looks as if we've got a challenge here to explain how we give a proper theory of truth that avoids these paradoxes and contradictions. And I want to, to, to think about some medieval solutions to this. I mean, the solutions to this have been around uh, you know, right since the ancient Greeks, and it's a big problem in modern philosophy of language uh, and philosophical logic. But there are quite interesting solutions that the medievals produced uh, for this. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll focus just on three solutions in particular. So if we come back to what we were saying there about, uh, you want to say, perhaps it's neither true nor false, or perhaps it's neither true nor not true. Can we, can we motivate something along these lines. And there were two particular ways of focusing on this. They say, well, what's really at the heart of this is there's a self-reference going on. You've got a sentence that's referring to itself, or you've got a person who's referring to him or herself uh, when they say, I'm lying. And 
Maybe the real problem behind this is the self-reference that goes on here. So normally if I say I'm lying, I might have come in from the street and said, you know, I had a, this, a blizzard out there, the snow's coming down, I'm lying, right? Just to reassure you. And often when I say I'm lying, I'm, I'm talking about some other utterance of mine. I wouldn't normally be referring to the very same utterance itself. And these philosophers would have said, that's what's wrong at the heart of this. You really can't self-refer, or at least you can't self-refer when you're talking about so important concepts like truth and falsity and lying. And they go by two names, these sorts of solutions. There's the restrictivists, the people who restrict reference, and they say, uh, whenever I try to self-refer, when I say I'm lying, I must be referring to another utterance, some other utterance. I can't be referring to this utterance itself. I must be referring to my last utterance, or perhaps I'm a prefix. You know, I say I'm lying, meaning I'm just about to tell you a lie. The next utterance will be a lie. That's the restrictivist solution. And then there's the cassationist solution. Uh, and the cassationists, it's a hor horrible long word, but cassatio was the, the word that the Latinists used. The cassationists say, uh, well, maybe if you try to do this, it's not so much that you end up referring to something else. You just end up not saying anything at all. It's just an empty sound. It looks like, it looks as if you've said something, but really you didn't succeed in saying anything at all. Uh, and, you, and, and, and you might challenge someone. Someone's trying to say this utterance, and you interrupt them and say, which utterance? This, this utterance. And they never get to say which particular utterance it is that they're referring to, the cassationist solution. And those solutions were very popular during the 13th century, that is, you know, uh, from 1200 onwards. But in the 14th century, uh, a man called Thomas Bradwardine came along, uh, and he was born around about 1300, and he died in the Black Death in 1349, very sadly. Uh, but he had a glittering career in Oxford uh, uh, in the first half of the 14th century. Um, he ended his career by being made Archbishop of Canterbury, and he'd actually only just been made Archbishop of Canterbury in Rome uh, from, by, by the Pope in 1349, and he rushed back to England to sort out problems that there were in England at the time, and immediately, within a week of landing at Dover, he died of the Black Death. It was a very, very sad end to his life. But before that, he'd also been very famous in the history of science, uh, and so there's a, a, a whole group of people, the Oxford calculators, who made immense strides in the mathematical physics. And he, he was basically a mathematician at heart, I think. He treated theology and logic and, and mathematics all in the same very mathematical way. Well, when he was a very young man in Oxford in the 1320s, uh, he came up with a very novel solution to the liar paradox. And it was a very clever idea that he had. His idea was that utterances can perhaps mean more than they look at first sight as if they mean. So uh, if we take another version of the liar paradox, the one due to Epimenides, Epimenides said all Cretans are liars. But it, when he said all Cretans are liars, he wasn't just saying all Cretans are liars, he was also saying that he himself was a liar. Right? And that's implicit in what he said. And Bradwardine's idea was when I say something, I'm also at the same time saying all the things that follow from what I said. And then he had a very clever argument that showed that if I actually say that I, what I'm saying is false, any, any, sent, any utterance that says of itself that it's false also says of itself that it's true. It's a, it's a, it's a subtle argument which we need to think about and take quite slowly and carefully. So. Suppose it also means something else besides that it's false. That's the idea. That, you know, we're looking to see what else is implicit in it. Suppo suppose it's false and something else. Right. Now, uh, if it's false, then something it says must fail to obtain. And among the things that, that it says are that it's false and this other thing. Maybe logicians like to say P. Uh, so the, the other thing it says. So if it's false, it follows that either it's not false or not P. Right. 
So if it's false, then either not P or it's not false. We can rephrase that, if it's false and P, then it's not false. And if it's not false, it's true. So if it's false and P, then it's true. But stop a moment. So the assumption was that what it means is that it's either false or P. And we're taking it that it also means whatever follows from what it means. And we've shown that it's being true follows from it's being false or P, which is what it means. So it follows that among the things it means or says must be that it's true. So we've got a proof. He calls it his second theorem, because as I say, he's a mathematician at heart. His second theorem is to say every sentence that says of itself that it's false also says of itself that it's true. Well, that means that the sentence is implicitly uh, contradictory, and so it couldn't possibly be true. Things couldn't be possibly be as it says they are, because it requires both that it be false and that it be true, and it can't be both false and true. So he overturned all the thinking in the 13th century that had been the restrictivists and the cessationists. He has a long section in his, in, in, in his, in his treatise on these subjects where he, make, he, he attacks and actually makes fun of the restrictivists and the cessationists. And then he comes up with his own uh, novel solution, which is this one that every utterance that says of itself that it's false also says that it's true, and so is false. And it can't be true because it's impossible to satisfy the criterion as to what it says. Now, Bradwardine had a lot of successors in the 14th century. Uh, a man called John Buridan, that people may have heard about, uh, also took up a very similar solution. Uh, it, var it varied in certain details. Uh, if, if people have heard about John Buridan at all, they'll have heard of Buridan's ass. Um, uh, Buridan's ass. It's nothing to do with the liar paradox, but it's a nice example of the ass uh, is equidistant from two very desirable bales of straw, and it can't make up its mind which bale of straw to go for. And it dithers in the middle so long that it dies of starvation between the two bales of straw. There's a, long, there's a big moral to that in ethics uh, and the theory of value, uh, but that's why Buridan is remembered to this day. The other reason that Buridan is remembered to this day uh, is because uh, there's, a, there's a famous story that he had an affair with the Queen of France. Uh, and uh, the Queen of France had lots and lots of affairs and then killed her lovers the following morning. And Buridan famously is the one who got away and wasn't killed. Anyway, Buridan picks up uh, around about 1350, you know, a bit later than, than Bradwardine. He, he, he comes up with a slightly different solution that, that says that it's not so much that propositions say of themselves that it's true, because that would make every proposition talk about itself. And you know, most propositions don't talk about themselves. The liar paradox is rather unusual in talking about itself. Uh, but at least they imply their own truth. And if at least it implies their own truth, then we can give a similar solution. And that's the one that has had a lot of influence in the 20th century, Buridan's solution. But Bramadine, Buridan, and a number of other interesting figures in the 14th century uh, had a, uh, solutions to the liar paradox along that line. <laughs>